code. All right, so now let's get started. First, we're going to hear from, um, from Kim Nelson. Since this event is part of the Nature of Writing series in partnership with the North Cascades Institute, I'm gonna invite Kim to say a few words. Uh, Kim is the Marketing and Executive Assistant for North Cascades Institute. She has worked for the Institute for one and a half years. And before that, she worked as a naturalist, ornithologist, and a park ranger. She also currently serves on the board of Skagit Audubon Society as the chair of Youth Education. So welcome, Kim. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay this time? <laughs> Great. So before I get started, I want to first acknowledge the Coast Salish people who have stewarded the land where I'm standing since time immemorial. Since I am in Anacortes, I want to personally acknowledge the Swinomish Indian tribal community, as well as the Samish Indian nation. I offer this acknowledgement as a first step in honoring their relationship with the land that we share, as well as a call towards further learning and action in support of our indigenous neighbors. Thank you. As Claire mentioned, I'm here today representing North Cascades Institute. If you are not already familiar with our organization, we are a conservation nonprofit, and our mission is to inspire environmental stewardship through transformative learning experiences in nature. Accordingly, we offer programs for people of all ages and backgrounds to explore and engage with nature in the hopes that they'll one day go on to protect these wild and sacred places. North Cascades Institute offers many different programs, um, including Mountain School, a three-day overnight environmental education experience for fifth grade students, as well as our Youth Leadership Adventures program, which offers multi-day backpacking and canoe camping field excursions for high school students. We also offer a diverse suite of adult and family programs. These include field excursions, family camps, art and writing retreats, online classes, and even boat tours. Most of our programs typically take place at the North Cascades Environmental Learning Center on the beautiful wooded shoreline of Diablo Lake in the heart of North Cascades National Park. We just recently reopened our facility to the public, so if you haven't been before, or if it's been a while, now is the perfect time to come up to visit. I also want to give a big plug for upcoming online classes and our field excursions. Um, we'll be covering topics like wolves and geology, reptiles, plants, including flowers, birds, painting, photography, and even wildlife tracking. You can find out all about these programs um, and sign up by visiting our website at ncascades.org. That's in as in north, cascades.org. You can also be the first to find out about our upcoming programs and events by signing up for our online newsletter. And I'll drop those links in the chat momentarily. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you, Kim. Okay, so now for our featured author. Let's see, Nathan Barnes, along with his brother, Jeremy, founded the popular website and hiking resource, hikingwithmybrother.com in 2009. They're known for including historical background, detailed maps and vibrant photos for every hike. The authors of two other guides, Alpine Lakes Wilderness, The Complete Hiking Guide, and Hiking Through History, Washington, they both live in Seattle. So Nathan is here tonight to talk about their brand new publications, Washington Wildflower Hikes, 50 Destinations, and this beautiful little guide right here, Washington, or excuse me, Pacific Northwest Wildflowers, a pocket reference. So please join me in welcoming Nathan Barnes. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for attending and uh, taking time out of your day to um, talk about wildflowers a little bit and learn about uh, what's contained in this book. I do have a, a presentation, so let's let's try that out. Um, normally, I do these sorts of things with with my brother and in person. So we're gonna we're gonna go through this and. and and it's going to be as almost as good as if I was there with you all. Um, so my name is Nathan Barnes. Uh, we, as Clara just explained, we've, uh, my, along with my brother, we founded um, hikingwithmybrother.com, um, a hiking what began as a blog and now it's sort of matured into a website. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, what we're going to do today is is probably just go through the book, talk a little bit about myself, um, tell you a little bit my, about my brother with, uh, and with the advantage of him not being here to refute what I say about him. And um, 
and then talk a little bit about the features of the book and some some stories. Um, so there we are. That's my that's my brother. That's what he would look like on another similar screen right next to me. Uh, were he here? Um, and this is the overview I was uh, mostly just uh, going through with now with the benefit of some wildfire wild flowers, uh, some balsam root and, and lupine there to sort of brighten what we're gonna what we're gonna go through tonight. Um, so let's 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 start out with with who I am and who who my brother is as well. Um, to give you a little bit of a insight as to why why a couple of brothers have written this this book about uh, wildflowers. So here's here's some pictures of us. Uh, I like to I like to bring it back to uh, where it all began. Um, I I think it's obvious which one is me and which one is my brother, but I'm the taller one, um, being the elder brother, uh, and have a slightly more um, uh, a slight bit more of a flair for showmanship than than he does. So this this journey to to publishing guidebooks really began back um, back when we were children, around this age, when my mother would take us hiking. Um, three kids, uh, long summers, you need something to really tire the kids out and something that doesn't cost a lot of money. So uh, hiking was a, was a great way to wear out three very energetic children. Along the way, uh, uh, that certainly got us into hiking itself, but uh, a little bit more germane to this guidebook, uh, my mother was, well, my grandfather was a, a nurseryman he raised rhododendrons, which is a difficult word to say today. He raised rhododendrons uh, for years and years, and my mother worked in, in the nursery with him. And plants have always been a passion of hers. And while we were on the trail, um, a great deal of the time my, was spent by my mother teaching, teaching us, mostly me, who had the most interest in it, um, what flowers and what plants were which, how to identify one, what the uses were, um, all of those things were just part of the hiking experience for for us. And so, over the years, uh, wildflowers have been part of. While we were sort of beginning our hiking journey, um, wildflowers were always sort of a part of it. So, um, you know, we we hiked as kids, and then we went to college, and they went through that fairly normal path. And afterwards, had decided um, a few years afterwards had decided we needed to. We needed something else to do. And my brother hit on this, this idea that what we should do is climb Mount Rainier. And at the time I was, uh, you know, this, this is uh, 12 years ago or so, um, I was not that enthused about this idea. I was, uh, it, it seemed, it seemed like a, a worthy goal, but not one that I was that interested in pursuing. But as, as everyone out there with siblings probably knows, uh, your 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 siblings have a way of convincing you that their idea is the best idea, and we really should head down that road. And so we did. We spent months training, and we climbed we climbed Mount Rainier, and we got to the top, two thousand and eight. And we had spent so much time, really training and spending time together, um, multiple hikes a week to build up the the sort of capacity and and endurance that we need to get to the top. Um, we just kept doing it afterwards. And being the kind of people we are, we started writing down what it was that we wanted, what, that we did, mostly because we thought we'd just forget. Um, we put it in a blog format and very quickly that sort of mushroomed into hikingwithmybrother.com, which was a, a resource that was more really more blog centric. This is 2009, 2010. Um, blogs were sort of, you know, they're still out there. Um, they weren't the hottest commodity. They weren't the next big thing, but they were also still um, still a viable uh, way of, of of sharing what we've learned. So eventually, we decided um, we we part we started partnering with folks. Um, you know, uh, the Seattle Times reached out to us and and asked to ask us to work with them a little bit. WTA, um, who I'm sure almost the audience was familiar with, the Washington Trails Association. Um, they we we started doing little partnerships, um, writing articles in various publications, and um, we reached out to a couple uh, pub, a couple of publishers, and um, they actually one the first one actually approached us and said, "Hey, would you like to do a book?" We thought, "Why not?" And um, that's where hiking through history came from, which was our first book. 
Um, thankfully, after that, we um, we were able to build off that and uh, partner with the Mountaineers, which has been a, an amazing partnership. Um, they have really elevated um, what it is Jeremy and I are able to do, really showcased it in a way that I think um, folks are able to engage with the hikes and really get a feel for what we are trying to do. Um, for us, uh, or at least for me, uh, the purpose of a guidebook is really to sort of look at the hikes out there, curate um, a selection of them and sort of make the mistakes that um, that everyone will have to make in order to figure out which of a subset of hikes are, are the best or what pitfalls are out there. And instead of doing it yourself, you can pick up a guidebook and it should have weeded out all the mistakes for you. Um, and that's really our sort of our goal when um, putting these sorts of things together. So I want to talk a little bit about the Wildflower book and what what we did, what the features are, um, what we're proud of, and um, just to get and, and for anybody that's purchased the book, not only thank you, but also give you the the knowledge to make the most out of out of out of the book. Get, get really all all the meat out of it. So um, the easy stuff, the fifty destinations, right on the cover. Um, but it does have both day hikes and mostly day hikes, and there are but there are overnights and the ability to. Um, get places that are a little bit more distant and, and, and backpack in. It, we cover um, all three national parks and the Mount St. Helens National Monument. Um, you know, there's flowers in it that you can find. There are hikes that have flowers in them that are flowering anywhere from April to October, so most of the year. Um, and we try and talk a little bit more in depth about um, the wildflowers themselves and um, really give some background on the, Put it, we've put an identification guide in there, which I'll talk about in a minute, and as well as put together the um, wildflower field guide to sort of enhance the experience to try and um, engage a little bit more. And I, I, I'll say before I get into the features, um, we're not botanists and we're not professionally trained um, um, or scientifically trained to, uh, to identify flowers. Uh, we are we wanted to write a book, I wanted to write a book that really opened the door for, for absolutely anyone to um, sort of enjoy, engage with, um, get a little bit more out of their hikes with wildflowers. So it's not a technical guide. It's as much as possible, we wanted it to be something that anyone can pick up and immediately buy the book that day, go to the trail, pick a hike out of the, out of the book, get to the, get to the trailhead start walking down and already be able to um, readily identify uh, a flower, know the name of a flower they find on the trail. Um, it's not meant to be uh, a, a technical guide. So I just want to put that out there just in case there, I'm, I'm sure there are members of our audience that uh, have spent, decades in interacting with flowers and can give and can readily cite the, the subtle differentiations between um, different species of of a particular flower and that is absolutely amazing and we we relied on the knowledge of those folks to in order to make sure we were as accurate as possible and i, I and i just want to make sure that everybody's able to have the tools to get to that place and that's what this book is really trying to do so firstly, uh, we, we covered the whole state. That was an important thing for us to do. And the, and the Mountaineers were great about encouraging us and supporting us to do that. Washington State is a home to a wide range of habitats uh, that are able to support vastly different sorts of plant life and wildflowers. So we wanted to make sure we were um, showcasing as many different as, as many different types of flowers as possible. Therefore, we needed to go to all the different diverse places that Washington State is it has to offer. There are hundreds and hundreds of species of wildflowers in Washington State. Um, uh, no one can even agree on an exact number. But in order to get the, you know, the, the widest array possible, we needed to be all over the state. We divided the book into five regions that are fairly intuitive. We've got you know, uh, the Olympic Peninsula and you know, the area around the Kitsap Peninsula. Um, then we have Eastern Washington, two sort of easy divides, and then we've divided up the, the Cascades into North, Central, and South. 
and in there there's a lot of different um uh, there's a lot of different habitats like readily you will you'll notice oh well uh certainly eastern washington is going to have a a drier um type of of, of ground the scrubland is going to support a different sort of li plant life um, the flowers tend to be more vibrant versus say something like the Olympic Peninsula where there's a lot more moisture. There's uh, the, the sea air is absolutely um, going to cultivate and support a different type of plant versus uh, the mountainous areas which have their different elevation levels from lowland forests all the way up to the alpine. And, and hopefully you can see it by this map, we kind of went all, we went all over and we wanted to, um, do it in an organized fashion so you'll see that it goes um we start over on, on the on in the olympic peninsula and head east to get all the way over to, to spokane in that area and within each region we do our best to to organize them in a way that it's you can just flip to a, a region and um those the hikes within that region are also organized um west to east so uh, you're able to, to have the experience of, of these different areas and you could do things like go to Ebby's Landing on Libby's Island and, and interact and, and find some uh, amazing species of plants here. Uh, and then flip all the way, you go to the central, you're on, you're, you're on Lewis Butte um, among the balsam root here um, near Winthrop. And um, from there, jet up to Chain Lakes, get a great view of Mount Baker there um, and get that, that taste of the alpine wildflowers. Um, this is Iceberg Lake, just um, anybody wanted to know. And so there's a lot of, we have the, the, the wildflower book itself has um, the 50 hikes, each of which has a, a featured wildflower, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then there's a, um, wildflower wildflower id guide which has photographs of um a hundred or so flowers uh i had envisioned that we would be doing sort of a quiz of, with wildflowers to see you know I'm, i know there's folks out there that are going to know a, a lot about these wildflowers and then uh I, I realized there's not a great way for us to interact so just imagine we're having a quiz and people have raised their hands and uh, they've guessed at what these are and I, they were all they were both correct. These are both uh, examples of um, flowers that are found on the alpine level. That's showy phlox um, on the at least the left side of my screen. I'm not sure if it's mirrored for you. And then um, small flower pensamon on the other side. Flowers that you know you're up you're up in the alpine region. These are what you're going to find up a little higher. Um, you go to um, sort of the uh, eastern Washington, um, just on the other side of the Cascades. Um, uh, Sagebrush violet on on my on my left, um, very low to the ground, but also very prevalent. And um, the yellow salsify, which I always find for some reason, I've always just been drawn to it as as a flower. There's something about the the thickness of the, the, just something about the way it presents itself, um, the way it closes itself up into that um, little tiny cone every night and then bursts open with such, with such um, vibrant yellow. It's always fascinated me as a flower. Um, and then, you know, you go into the lowland forests and, and you find something like um, the Cliffs of Orchid or sometimes uh, Fairy Slipper Orchid. Um, and then Indian Pipe, which is a fascinating, um, fungal flower that um, just sort of seems to appear from the ground um, overnight. Um, and then these these photos here uh, are, I would say, purely here because my my brother would, cannot get enough of, of marmots and other wildlife. Uh, so uh, among our travels and among these hikes, these are all these are all photographs taken uh, while we were hiking the hikes in this book, you know, whether it's the marmot, the chipmunk, the, the deer, um, he also managed to get them <laughs> uh, near wildflowers, although they're not always in the best view. I, the, the glacial lilies there with the chipmunk are particularly impressive, but you know, uh, it's not just about the wildflowers, it's also about everything else you're able, you're able to see along the way, all of which, like I said, we found um, while, while hiking. So um, let me just walk you through some of the features of the book. Those of you that have the book, um, 
can flip to that and, and see, oh, well, this is actually right there. Um, to begin with, very what, what is now almost the standard for guidebooks, um, all of our hikes will have all of that information right at the front. Um, the whole caption at the beginning, not only does it, it does it contain the what we find it, what everybody at this point finds, but um, what is important for us, how long is it, how high are we going, um, and what kind of what's the elevation gain along the way. There's also a, a lot of other information on here that's that's pretty helpful. Um, the difficulty section, I always like to mention, um, you know, when you have a, a categorization that is absolutely subjective, um, there's really, I've, I've seen lots and lots of different attempts at it to try and convey, uh, well, how much work is, is this going to be? We do um, just easy, moderate, and hard. Uh, there's definitely harder moderate hikes and there is moderately easy hikes and there's, you know, hikes that we say are hard that some people might find it moderate. Um, we're, we're, we're really just operating off of, okay, well, how much, what's the distance and what's the elevation? And when you look at that, what's, what's, what's the change? Is it, how steep is it? And then we factor in like, okay, well, how difficult it is, is it to navigate these sections or their particular hazards? And our, we've, we use the same difficulty rating um, throughout all of our books and our hope is that, and our, and our website, and our hope is that over time, um, people that use our, use our um, guidebooks and our website will find, okay, this is what hiking with my brother means by hard. Okay, this is what they mean by moderate. And so we just try to be as consistent as possible there. So this, it not only does it contain everything here, it contains the GPS to the trailhead. If you want to plug that into your, into your car's navigation, it's there gives you the information on the maps so that you can have maps in hand. We always recommend having a map of at least the general area. Even if you have a GPS, it's always good to have. Um, all the directions are there. And also um, in, slightly different, uh, in a slightly different way from other um, iterations that we've done, we've, we sort of put an abstract, which we've done in the past, but this we put the abstract sort of between as part of the caption so that it's really you know, you can read just the one or two sentences that are there and get an idea of whether or not it's worth your, worth your time or it piques your interest enough to, to really read the rest of the hike. Really cognizant of the fact that, you know, this is a reference guide. This is, it is supposed to give you the information that you want in a, in a quick and um, uh, predictable way. So you'll definitely find the, when you get into reading a hike, they're organized the same way every time. They're that way, you, if you know, if you've read a couple of them, you're like, okay, I can skip to the third paragraph here. I don't need to, I don't need to go ahead and read this whole thing. The part I want to know is going to be around here. Because again, you know, our goal is to, to get you the information you need so that you can spend less time reading and more time on the trail. So the feature wildflower, uh, I'm, I'm very excited about this. This is something that um, I thought at the time I came up with it was a was a brilliant uh, insight. It's in in the uh, in the years that have passed since I pitched this book, which is about six years ago now. Uh, I think another guidebook has come up with a similar, although not the same, sort of concept. The idea here was if you're going to go out, if you if you bought a book on wildflower hikes and you want to see wildflowers, you should know. Oh, there should be a wildflower that you you're pretty much, you know, you're going to see. Um, so what we've done is for every hike, we have, you know, kept an eye out for a flower that um, is quite common, uh, that is um, easily identifiable, and ideally as an association with the hike. We don't always hit that last mark because sometimes you just can't find uh, a flower to associate with a hike. But in most, in, in all cases, the flower that we feature here in this wild, the featured wildflower section is, if it's in bloom, it, you will find it on that hike, um, which I just think is a, is a great way to kind of connect with the hike. We've also put a little check bar box there. I don't know if you can see it sort of faint there. I like the idea, and this is, you know, a little insight into how my mind works. I like the idea of collecting, of, of checking that box, of saying, you know what, I went and uh, I'm going to go through this book. I'm going to do these hikes. Or I'm going to do these hikes to with the idea of finding these flowers, and I, I'm going to check it off, and I'm going to fill this book up. 
I, uh, that's, that's something that I, it's the kind of person I am. And uh, hopefully, uh, um, you know, as you, as you, as someone who's reading these books gets into them, uh, finds, you know, I want to, I want to see these flowers and it's a great way to keep it organized. So not only, the, so you got, you've got that aspect, aspect, which you also get, I'm going to give you, you give a little bit more information here. You get a little bit more detail on how to identify that particular flower. Uh, sometimes I, if there's interesting little factoids about that, uh, about that wildflower, I'll add that in there. And then there's the other wildflowers in the trail section, which is the other important part about the featured wildflowers. So that little section there is every wildflower that we were able to identify when we, when we hiked that trail. That it's not meant to be an exclusive list. Um, it is meant to be uh, a rough guide of what you're likely to find along the trail. Ideally, you're gonna find more, but you're, if you're looking for something and you're like, and you're, maybe you've already caught the bug and you have a list of wildflowers you wanna see, uh, checking this list out will let you know, okay, well, I, I want to find in this case, um, I've been looking for um, a chocolate lily. So I'm going to go to Mimma Mounds and I'm going to identify that and it's going to be great. Um, so I also, the other reason it's there is um, as, an, as an author, wildflower focused hikes tend to, they tend to have this wildflower list in them somewhere in the narrative. Uh, and so I wanted to take that out. It's a little distracting while you're reading to, to get to and turn around and on this corner. And when, and you'll see here a, mul a multitude of wildflowers, including, and then they'll, they'll list six to 10 wildflowers. It's just, uh, I thought it would be a little bit more approachable to see it from, uh, see it from here. So, and there's there, if there's any feedback on that in the future, I, I hope you'll pass it along to either me or the Mountaineers. Um, so we have detailed maps. I think everyone is used to seeing that. Uh, it's the only thing that we've tried to do here is add a little bit more on where you can camp, uh, a little bit more on um, the trails that are nearby. So uh, when guidebook authors do these, um, create these maps, uh, they work with the map maker, map maker at the publisher, and everything you see on here we have labeled. So they they will put all the labels on that we asked them to. So um, we've gone and tried to tried to give as much additional information as possible to, to just orient yourself and to see what's what's nearby. History, as Claire said at the, at the top, we're, we're known for adding history in and we're known for hand, we're known for that because I, I am I am compelled to do it. I can't stop. Uh, I, I think every trail I know every trail has a story to tell. There's there's a reason that there's a trail where that you're walking on. Um, and some of the most interesting ways to engage with the trail is to is to really find, okay, well, what's the story? Why why is this here? And so um, the history will cover everything from mining to um, you know indigenous people uh, to um, explorers that came through um, or to interesting um, people that discovered the trail. So uh, that's just there. And then there's a there's an ID guide. Uh, and, and, and this is just a, a clip of it. All it really is is the name of the of the plant, the name of the flower or more sometimes bush, um, picture of it and the name. If it's a featured wildflower to get more information on it, um, that, that number um, right there is is. So you could just, this is just part of having the book and you're able to, to kind of go around with it. Uh, lastly, there is the field guide, which is sort of a companion to the book. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's quite simple. It's, it's only about, I don't know, this big. And it, it contains uh, a lot more information about the about the flowers, all of the flowers that are in the, the pocket guide are also pictured in, in the wildflower. Garden. So that's that's interesting. So how we made it, I think this is a, a fairly um, sort of brief brief story. Um, we made it by we made it by going on hiking, and, and we just you know plugged away at it for six years. Um, but I just want to, you know, highlight and talk about what Jeremy does, um, especially because he's not here to, to, to share it with you himself. So 
Jeremy is the is our photographer, and he's over the fifteen years or so that we've been doing hiking with my brother. Um, he has really elevated his game. Um, and when you're when you're looking at this book and you're engaging with this wildflower book, and you're and you're and you open it up, the the pictures that that are really going to capture your attention are all Jeremy. Um, except for the cover uh, i took the picture of the cover uh, the, that was that's my one saving one I, I occasionally sneak a few in but um in most cases uh jeremy has done a, a great deal of, of photography of editing and really um he's really brings the book to life he also does um all the maps and he is also our organizer he is our planner um you know and and <laughs> even though it took six years the reason it took six years was we were working on another guidebook at the same time but um his ability to kind of get us organized and make sure we're we're on track to deliver what we need to deliver um that's all that's all jeremy um so he also runs the website all the technical aspects of that he's an engineer and um he's he really supports us that way so what i do um uh, aside from giving Zoom presentations, uh, I I do all the writing. If there's if there's a word, I've I have written it. Um, Jeremy is not uh, that interested in doing the writing aspects. He'd rather he'd rather be what you know editing editing photos. I also in this particular book have done the vast majority of the plant identification, the organization of all the flowers, the um, all the obviously all the history, all the words, and all the um, sort of the design ideas that didn't come from the publisher that's all that's kind of what i do so together we we make a whole guidebook author which is pretty exciting stuff um so that's that's actually that's that's i say that's all i do but it's you know it's it's where all the information comes from so just so that you're aware when you're reading the book you, you know which one of the the people on the front you can blame when when uh you don't like one of the other two things so I'm just, um, I want to tell you a couple of stories. Um, and then I want to talk about, uh, I want to just kind of check in with the group. I know there's a couple of questions out there. I can answer those. Um, no one wants to listen to someone monologue for that long. So I will, uh, I'll, I'll try and keep it a little bit brief. Um, so I wanted to talk about Ancient Lakes. I think Ancient Lakes is a is a uh, a hike that a lot of our audience will be aware of. Um, it's you know it's proximity to the gorge alone um, probably has meant that a lot of folks on the call have at least heard of it. The reason I wanted to mention it is it's a great example of of a situation in which <laughs> guidebook authors have uh, approach a hike thinking that it's going to be not such a big deal, and then you know one thing leads to another. So Ancient Lakes, as you probably know, is, and, and if even if you don't, is in eastern Washington near Vantage. And um, we wanted to go there because uh, the Ancient Lakes themselves are a, sort of a fat, they're a fascinating geological feature. They were created during the Ice Age plunge, uh, the Ice Age floods. Um, they're actually a plunge pool that uh, as, as floods came over from the from towards Missoula, when the ice when the ice dam that was holding back Glacial Lake Missoula broke, all of that water came rushing across um, Idaho and Washington and crashed into where uh, the Columbia River is there. And as it was coming over that uh, over a, a lip there, it bored down into the the, the softer rock rock below and created a plunge pool, and that's what we what we think of ancient lake what we what we're calling ancient lakes today that's what it is the the lakes themselves are you know the water in them aren't from that time they're uh, they 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 should be dry the, the water that's in them is all it's actually agricultural extra water it's when watering nearby crocs um, crops that kind of flows into those uh, those ponds and fills them up it's a lovely hike. It's uh, it's it has a geologically speaking, it's stunning. There's great wildflowers in it, but I'm I'm, I'm bringing it up mostly because of the the harrowing uh, <laughs> experience that my brother and I had. I, uh, you know, my I took my wife and my daughter Myrna, and uh, he took uh, my brother took his wife, and this this is us setting up camp at at along the Columbia there, 
And it was, um, I, I think what we did, thinking that it was going to be quite an easy hike, we just didn't think about too much that, you know, well, there's a campsite nearby, we'll just do it. We forgot that we were near Vantage, which is famous, infamous for its winds. Uh, and with our one-year-old daughter at the time. Uh, so what more or less what happened is overnight, a, a storm, uh, the windstorm whipped up and I, uh, I awoke with the, the tent being blown down so far, it was, it was compressing over the, the sort of pack and play that my daughter was sleeping in. She didn't wake up, but my wife and I are there looking at the tent. That tent is, you can, I can stand in that green tent there. And it's coming down nearer to our faces. And we eventually gave up. We, we eventually just said, okay, well, let's just get in the car. We're going we're gonna to have to pack up. It's the middle of the night. So we've done that. The, 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 my daughter's woken up. She's upset. We end up driving around till she falls asleep. We end up sleeping in the car. My, my brother's wife has gotten up because it, it's, it's so, it's the, the winds are so fierce that she can't sleep and we can hear the tents of, and equipment of other people nearby um, just rolling through the night. And she got in the car and went to sleep. My brother <laughs> managed to not even wake up at all and just slept through the entire thing and woke up serenely the next morning asking, you know, what, what's, what's the problem guys? What's, what's going on? Uh, and it's, <laughs> it's a, <laughs> It's a story that works a lot better when when my brother is when my brother is here to to protest that he you know he didn't do anything wrong while the rest of us had a miserable night. For all for a, a hike that so you know it's it's relatively flat it's it's nice and easy and we ended up just being exhausted from it and it's just a short lesson in like in making sure that you sort of are aware of what's going going on around you and um, you know do a little research on maybe if are there going to be high winds. Maybe, maybe check that out first. Um, and that's, that's just a quick picture of ancient lakes and the, uh, the sort of the cliffs that were sculpted by, um, by that ice age flooding, which it's a, it's a very cool place to go. If you haven't been, I highly recommend it. Um, quickly Columbia Hills for, if you, if you have kids and you're looking for a hike that you want to take kids on, uh, yeah, this is a picture of my daughter right there. Her name is Myrna, and she had a fantastic time. She's probably two, two and a half there. Um, it's located down near near the Dalles, right on the Columbia again. And I I have to the the mountain sides are just here. I'll, I'll show you. Uh, the mountain sides are just covered in lupine and 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 balsam root, and just this stunning display that you most of the hike is is it's wandering through this you know, former ranch that has only recently in the last 10 years or so gotten actual trails. Uh, and it's on a, on, a, on a day like we had last weekend in, in around in Seattle, uh, bluebird skies, the fields of this, they're just, they're absolutely stunning. And it's hard to get, you know, a, a view like this without going, um, you know, on hikes that that require a lot more elevation gain, that might be a, more difficult to access. It's um, I highly recommend it. You know, Myrna had a lovely time, and um, you know the the it's thronged with folks trying to get amazing photographs of wildflowers, and it's there's a, it's completely understandable why why they want to do that because it's such a it's such a nice and amazing place. Um, let's see, so I I don't want to take up uh, too much of everybody else's time. I also I'd love to answer questions and talk uh, about um, specifics that, that people might have. Um, you know, my, my goal here is just to tell you a little bit about the book and to, to be a resource. So um, Claire, if you wanna come back and help facilitate, I'm happy to answer questions and hang out. Wow, the, <laughs> I'm still kind of chuckling to myself about that story about your brother because Someone in the chat said that's such a great sibling story, and that's so true. That seems like <laughs> yeah. very much a brother thing to have happen. Like what? What? <laughs> what? what? <laughs> it was yeah, yeah. That's funny. Um, so uh, we have had some folks who've been making some nice comments in the chat, um, and uh, there are some questions in the chat and in the Q and A. And so let's let's look at the in the Q and A. We have. Um, 
Kathleen actually wants to know um, about in the book when you when you list the mileage for a trail, is it round trip or is that just one way? Oh, it's it's always round trip. Okay. Yeah, because the reason for that is um, the goal is to give you an idea of everything you're going to have to do that day. So um, yeah, it's always going to be the total mileage and the total elevation that you're going to have to do. Today. Okay, great. Um, and Carolyn says, uh, would you describe a particular hike where it is and what time of year the flowers are in bloom and which flowers? So like, could you kind of highlight maybe one of you sort of did, did that a little bit with the ancient lakes and the one that you just mentioned, but I'm wondering about maybe, maybe she wants to know about a, a, a another sure. hike. Sure. Um, I'll give you um, perhaps one of the more famous or um, I, don't know, I would say, I don't want to say more famous. Grand Park in, in Mount Rainier is one of the most, one of the largest wildflower meadows I have ever encountered. Uh, it is a massive rolling meadowland, uh, just absolutely filled with flowers. Um, there's multiple approaches to it. Uh, and it, because of the, the, the meadowlands and how big it is, and it just sort of truly stunning, it's on this backdrop with, with Mount Rainier just looming above this greenery surrounded by, um, you know, pines and, and um, conifer forest. There are multiple approaches to it. Um, what we have done is we've given sort of what's known as the backdoor approach. And the reason for that is that it's a lot faster than um, the more traditional approach, which it, it about halves the distance. So that's the route we describe in the book, although you can find it um, and other resources will tell you how to go the more traditional route. Um, that tends to um, that tends to be a midsummer hike, um, early to midsummer. You want to catch the wildflowers. Um, you know, it starts with the the avalanche lilies and the glacier lilies, and um, sort of develops into um, the later spring um, flowers. I would say going there um, May, late May is is ideal. Uh, it tends to, because of its because of its location, it tends to get a lot of bugs, not only because of flowers, but also just the proximity to um, some water features. So you you want to try and go before the bugs get too bad because it can be it can be a little intense. But it's it's if you have the right protection for it, um, it's a truly stunning, um, truly stunning landscape. So that's I'd have to look at what number it is, but it's um, if you want to look in the book. And I, what, what was I, the name of that one again? It's called Grand Park. Um, Grand Park. Grand Park. Um, absolutely. It is highly recommended. I'll see if I can. Great. While you are looking for it, um, let's see. Someone is asking, does your book give any blooming time range for the featured flowers? And um, Yes. Another yeah, and I think maybe the same person wants to know why you included Scotch broom. I, well, uh, I've included Scotch broom um, for a couple of reasons, and I and I I will admit I absolutely debated on whether or not this should be something to include um, for the variety of reasons. I'm sure the the questioner is is thinking like, why are you in this 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 thing. Primarily the reason that it's in there is that it's so ubiquitous and it's, it's everywhere. And taking it from the point of view of someone that is just going down the road of plant identification, I didn't want to exclude things simply because they're basically kind of weeds or a nuisance. Um, I didn't want to, this, this was, this is a plant that I know people are going to see on the trail. Um, so I wanted to just acknowledge that, uh, the inclusion was not an intention to, to, to elevate it to anything other than, than, than what it is just for purposes. of identity. Okay. And did you, did you include the blooming time range for the flowers in the book? Yes, there's, there okay. are, uh, blooming time ranges for, um, there should be for all the featured wildflowers. Um, and if it's not in the featured wildflower itself, the um, every hike has a featured bloom time. And 
that should include the YouTube wildflower. The pocket reference also has bloom times. Okay. That's helpful. Yeah. I love the organization of the book. It's really, it's, it's, it's laid out really well. And um, wow, your brother is amazing ph photography. So that's. Yes, he will, he will be happy to hear that. Um, absolutely. He's yeah. The photography is really, really, it's, it's one of the reasons you want to pick up the book. So I'm, I'm very, I'm very pleased with all the effort he's put into it. Um, Nancy wants to know what area do you think provides the best wildflower opportunities in the first half of June? In the first half of June? Um, mm -hmm. So by the time you're in the first half of June, a lot of the spring flowers have already sort of, they're already spent. Um, you're, you're better off at sort of the, the mid to alpine level at that point. Um, so uh, Central Cascades is probably where you want to go. And um, it depends on, it depends on what you're really looking for. But um, I would say you, you want to, you want a little bit of elevation, you want to get closer to the snow line. So I guess as a general reference, what you want to do when you're, when you're out hunting wildflowers is, is take consideration of where the snow line is and try to get up to it as close as possible. The alpine stuff that's way up, you know, 6,000 feet and above, um, most of that stuff is going to bloom significantly later as the snow melt takes much longer. The wildflowers tend to sort of emerge right as the melt is happening. So by mid-June, you're going to want to be up around 3,000 feet um, around that area. And um, I don't know, is that, is that, is it, do you get the sense that, that answers the question? I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, Janice wants to know if any of the hikes um, are within a short drive of Seattle area and are suitable for walking with creaky knees. Creaky knees? Yeah. Um, I'm sure, yeah. Um, depend, it, it depends on what you mean by the short distance. Um, most of them are a little bit, you know, a little bit of a drive. One sec while I, um, I have an idea and I want to make sure that sure. I, um, I got it correctly. That's not going to work. That's not going to be one. Um, it's the, the tough part is the, is the close drive from Seattle. So, you know, if you were going to Chinook Pass, Tipsy Lake, that's great for creaky knees. Um, but it is a little bit of a drive. You're going to have to drive, um, you know, basically to Mount Rainier and beyond. Um, but I'm going to recommend that one simply because it is one of the easiest places to get some great alpine, um, some great alpine wildflowers um, with very little effort on your part. And like a trip around Tipsu Lake is less than a mile. It's half a mile tops. It's a little bit crowded, but you still, you get, um, especially if you go a little bit earlier or you go midweek, you know, clear out the, clear out the crowds a little bit. There's some great wildflowers there. There's also a much longer trail around the back of, of, um, of Natchez Peak that has a lot of the paintbrush there is super vibrant and you get the great, uh, the great, uh, views of Mount Rainier there as well. Um, stuff that's closer that, um, I'll have to think about it. Don't let me forget. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll try not to. Um, so Isaiah, I touched on this a little bit, I think with the, um, with one of the previous questions, but um, Isaiah is hoping, could you do a quick, like best general times during the year um, for different elevations and regions um, for, for the, be the best time to see the wildflowers? The best time and the def the best elevations and regions. Yeah, that's. Right. I don't know how that's going to be a quick answer, <laughs> but well, <right. laughs> I mean, I could I could give a quick answer, but it's okay. probably not going to be very satisfactory. Um, so, from the onset, not all wildflowers come out at the same time. So, um, part of the part of the difficulty there is okay. I want to see a particular wildflower, how best to see it. And if you have, and if, if you narrow it down that way, then there's an actual optimal times based on the, on the blooming cycle of that particular plant. 
if you're just going for, okay, I want to go and see, I want to make sure there are wildflowers there. I don't care what they are, but I just want some color on the trails. That's, that's what I'm looking for. At that point, you're really, it's, it's similar to the answer I gave earlier. Um, setting aside, um, we're just talking about the mountains right now, setting aside the, the peninsula and Eastern Washington, you're really just chasing the snow line. So lower elevations, you're gonna get the most flowers in April, May. Um, and as and that just that window just keeps following the snow line up. Um, and it's gonna change from year to year just based on how heavy that that snowpack is and how hot the the year progresses. You're, it is entirely dependent on how fast that snow is melting because that's that that drives everything about about the wildflowers in the mountains. If you're on the if you're in um, eastern Washington or you're sort of on the coast, that's a little bit more controllable. Uh, the cycles there tend to be very similar because the elevation tends to be fairly uniform. So um, for the desert stuff, I like um, I like June. At that point, almost you know the biggest and the brightest wildflowers are are almost always prevalent. There are some on their shoulder season wildflowers uh, for both of those, but like the big stuff, the bright stuff, you know, you're hitting in the, that area, those areas in June, you're gonna you're gonna see it. And you're gonna you're gonna have a wildflower experience, especially on the, in the eastern side of the mountain. Um, the peninsula, while it tends to be very uniform, it it doesn't have the vibrancy that the desert has, or frankly, the sort of the alpine areas have. Um, it's just the nature of of the the flowers that that um, are there. They're, they they don't pop quite as much, but um, you know, the rhododendrons on the coast, they're out earlier. They're out in April around now. And um, the rest of it's kind of low elevation stuff. So um, it's May, June. Okay. Yeah, so that you're makes right. sense. You're right. That wasn't short. <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. It it, it, it made, made absolute sense. I, that, the rule of thumb of following the snow line, I think, is right. that's that's the key right there, right? I mean, for the mountainous regions. Um. Beverly wants to know what you use for bug protection. Oh, <laughs> no, if only my brother were here. Uh, we have an ongoing debate about DEET. We have okay. DEET. <laughs> I'm a big fan of, of DEET. Um, he is not. He finds it um, just, he doesn't like the way it feels. Um, I personally feel that um, any concentration of, of high concentration of, of DEET is the most effective. Um, my brother uses, uh, a, I, it seems like a rotating door of different alternatives that are not deep. Uh, and it's, I think it's actually evolved to the point where it doesn't matter what it is. It has gotten to the point where he just doesn't want it to be deep because that's what I'm using and he's determined to find <laughs> something better. Um, so uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't so much answer the question. Um, I, so I don't know what to use this. I, I, I prefer deep. Um, it is a little, I don't want to say, toxic but it is very leaves a taste in your mouth so there's that that downside yeah yeah um avital wants to know if you have any and th this is a good question for you i think tips on admiring or iding wildflowers while keeping up pace and mileage goals right um it depends on what you want to do so uh, because I have the same thing. We, we, the pace is, pace is important to my brother and I, and so is, um, we generally have some goals and the re for us, we're off, we're often trying to fit in more than one hike a day. So we got to keep going. Um, what I would say a good strategy is, uh, rely on the, the featured wildflower, um, profile at, at first and really just stick to, okay, I want to find one wildflower. If, if you approach a wildflower hike, with, I wanna identify as many flowers as possible, don't try to have a pace because once you start slowing down and start trying to look at every flower or even you know every other flower, you quickly find, oh my gosh, there's a lot of different flowers here and I don't know what any of them are. And over time, you, you'll get better at it. You're like, oh, okay, that's gonna be fine. I know what that is. Oh, okay, you know, I've, I've seen Columbine before. But if once you, you know, 
you get to a point where you're like, I don't know the difference between that little white flower and that little white flower. I know they're different, but I, ooh. and you can spend a, a heck of a long time just trying to figure it out. So a strategy that we ended up having because we were writing a guidebook in which we needed to identify as many flowers as possible is we would look at it, see if we could identify it within a moment or two, and then just take a really um, a high res photo and, and move on and identify it later. Very good. Um, so a question from a Texan visiting in June. Uh, what nice. are the most dangerous animals I could encounter on these hikes? Um, the, most, the most dangerous animal you're likely to encounter is are the mountain goats. That is, um, that is the, they will, they will mess you up. Um, so if you encounter a mountain goat on some of these hikes, especially the higher alpine hikes um, around Mount Rainier or, you know, in the enchantments area, anything like that, they seem cute, leave them alone. Just give them distance and, and stay away from them. The, there's been a number of deaths over the years, um, far more than, you know, any bear or cougar or anything like that that generally is associated with dangerous animals. You will, you, you might um, see a bear. Um, they're very unlikely to do anything other than run away. So, um, but if you do, you know, obviously keep your distance. The, the, the most dangerous thing are, are those, are those sheep, those animals. Okay. That, that actually is surprising to me. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, I will there, steer yeah, clear of the will, goats. Those yeah, horns I will think... open you up in a horrible, horrible way. Yes, yeah. it's very difficult Ooh. to get you in, get you someplace to right. patch you up right. in it quickly. Right, don't approach the goats. Um, Joyce wants to know where, where can I get the current snow line elevations? Oh, um, there's a couple of good resources for that. Um, the easiest way probably is just to go to WTA. Um, that's, I, I don't get paid for saying that, but, um, the Washington Trails Association has done a fantastic job of, of cultivating a community that when people go out and they do a hike, they come back and give you um, the sort of the conditions of the trail and they'll inevitably say, oh, I hit snow at this point. And it is, it is, a, it is a fantastic resource um, that we use all the time. You can also, um, the ranger stations will know and you can give them a call. Um, finally, less reliable, but online, all the, the ranger districts have trail conditions that you can look up. Okay, okay, what's going on along with this trail? And, that, and they will tell you whether or not, usually it's this trail has been cleared, um, partially cleared, still snowed. Um, the lag time on that is a little long though. It's usually a week or two, if not longer. So it's not as, as helpful as. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, and one last question. Um, Stephen wants to know, what's a hike where you saw the most amazing diversity of wildflowers? The amazing diversity of wildflowers. Ooh, that is hard. I mean, I'm tempted to say Grand Park again, um, which is, there's, yeah, I wanna say Grand Park. Uh, just because there's a, there was a, a wide variety in there. Um, however, barring that, anything where you are changing a great deal of elevation is uh, an excellent place to, to start because you will start, if you can start in the lowlands, something like Dog Mountain, um, where you, will, you start right next to the Columbia, where the lowland forest is filled with, you know, you'll find clips of orchids and um, other, you know, the Indian pipe, those two that are on top of mind because I just saw them. You'll find those down low and then you'll scoot all the way up to the top and you, it's not quite high enough to get a ton of alpine, but you know, there's mountain heather, there's the columbine, there's um, uh, lupine, that sort of thing. And when, if, if it was slightly higher, you would really get into more flocks and, um, Pensamons and things like that. So those, I, I honestly, if you're looking for a lot of, uh, of wildflowers, I, I would, I would, and you haven't been to Grand Park, go to Grand Park. And then after that, sort of look at 
flip through the book and look for a hike that has a featured flower, a featured flower list that says additional uh, flowers on the trail, that's pretty long. Um, and th those are the those are the two that I would, I would look to. Okay, Grand Park, page one sixty three to one sixty six. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, you're supposed to. I think that's what. It yeah, said yeah. The index. Um, yes, there's not a diversity of of. In this particular photo, you don't see the diversity I was hoping for, um, but you do get you do get Mount Rainier. Um, it also any picture like this, you sort of lose out on just how stunning it is. It looks a little too green, and mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to what it was like when we were there. Okay. Wow. Well, thank you so much. I did put the link in the chat um, directly to the page of Village Books website where you can purchase books by Nathan and Jeremy Barnes. There was one final um, sure. comment in the chat for you. Um, Myrna Barnes says, hi, daddy, I love you. <laughs> so oh, wow. I'll have to, I'll have I to wanted to save that, that for last. Oh, I that's adorable. <laughs> that's, that's great. I didn't even know she's watching. <laughs> yep. You should be in bed. What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> so as a reminder, here are Here's the book and the pocket guide, just like they are on the screen. Um, they are beautiful. As I was telling Nathan before we went live, I have picked these as my my summer staff pick for Village Books for the for the best gift you can give anybody who's going to be coming to the Pacific Northwest or or lives here. So um, thank you so much, Nathan. This has been fun. Of course, my pleasure. Yeah. All right. Um, any final words before we say goodnight? No, I, I, I again appreciate everybody taking the time to come and listen to me chat a little bit about about this book. You can, uh, if you have questions, you want to follow up um, where I'm at hiking with my brother at gmail.com, which you can send um, emails there that we can that we will get back to you as quickly as we can. And um, yeah, if there's something that they have a burning question, send it there. All right. Well, thank you so much. And with that, um, you can this actually, if anyone registered for this and they weren't able to attend tonight, this actually is going to be available on our YouTube channel. So um, right. thank you very much. And I think with that, we will say good night. All right. Good night. Thank you. Good night.